join the following program already in progress. Goro Miyazaki is a filmmaker and former landscape architect and son of the famed Studio Ghibli savant Hayao Miyazaki, who has made such films as Spirited Away, Princess Mononoke, My Neighbor Totoro, Howl's Moving Castle, Porco Rosso. There's so many, right? And, and, and. I guess it'd be hard to live up to that kind of expectation because Goro's movies are not very good. Goro's movies, in fact, represent some of the darkest points in all of Studio Ghibli's entire lineup of films. He has directed the films Tales from Earthsea, From Up on Poppy Hill, and Earwig and the Witch. If you've seen a documentary with, with Hayao Miyazaki working and you've seen his process happen and how, how brutal he is to some of the animators, it's very obvious that it comes from a place of him just knowing exactly what he wants and what he is doing. Because when you see him draw, when you see him animate, he doesn't miss. Kinda at all. He has developed the eye for what is exactly right to convey an emotion, to convey a, a object in motion, or just how, how people express themselves and behave and how things should be lit. He is potentially the greatest master of 2D animation that has ever lived. Goro, um, Goro was a landscaper. Goro was a landscaper, and, and, um, the stories are, are kind of mixed, whether or not Goro stepped in on his own, or was forced in, or pressured in, or, or what situation led to him directing, uh, Tales from Earthsea. Suffice to say, he was underprepared. His filmographic style, um, has not really recovered since. Things that I think Goro, uh, does understand about, uh, uh, filmmaking and storytelling. He, he does understand uh, that there should be a young female protagonist because his dad did that a lot. Little surface level there, bud, but okay, we're, we're moving down. Um, making things curly, but that's also pretty surface level and doesn't really matter. Um, moral complication. That's interesting. Yeah, I think I think he's pretty good at, at laying a, a groundwork of something that is morally complicated. Daddy issues. We're going to skip that. Um, Architecture and interior design, he is actually really good at that. I wish he would go back to it. Uh, that he didn't plan on being a filmmaker. He does talk about that a lot. Why Hayao is right. There's a widely known story about how Hayao Miyazaki was incredibly rude to Goro throughout Goro's first uh, attempt at directing a film. And that Hayao wouldn't speak to him. Hayao wouldn't help him at all. But Hayao seems to have been correct in all the things that he was asserting about Goro and what he was trying to teach Goro. Now, Hayao might not have been um, a good dad, maybe. He seems like a really nice person and he seems really good with kids. And I think he loves the sort of enchanting power that he has. And I think he's a really talented filmmaker, especially for children, because he... he tries to make things that are intentional and thoughtful that that children will notice and enjoy most of all maybe he was a better dad to us than he was to goro but not to mention that goro is viciously critical of all father figures in all of his movies like they're either rageaholics murdered and die like in from up on poppy hill or they're really stern and unapproachable does that sound familiar at all to you, Goro? A really stern and unapproachable but inexplicably talented father figure. Does that resonate with you even a little bit, Goro? And Howl's moving castle comes a breathtaking adventure. Tales from Earthsea. 
Tales from Earthsea is interesting in that it was originally going to be directed by Hayo, but he was so busy with Howl's Moving Castle and still finishing that up, which, um, you know, good call. That, that movie turned out really well. So there was a director slot open for Tales from Earthsea. For whatever reason, Goro wound up in the director's seat with no experience. Even getting outside of the, the family drama and that in Goro's um, premiere film that the protagonist kills his father in the first five minutes. Tales of Mercy is, is well animated. Um, that's about it. The storytelling is really jumbled and the, the, the ending just does not land. I want to learn. It's it's so it's so confused towards the end, like what what this movie is trying to mean or say or or what's really transpiring on screen. It doesn't come through clearly, really at all. Hayo has talked about before in in one of one of the documentaries uh, about him is is that he makes movies for children, and this is not. A movie for ch can you see this dragon getting killed right now this this is not a movie for kids it's really spooky at times it doesn't have like ghibli vibes there's no sense of awe and wonder there's no childhood glee i mean there's a little bit of appreciation in nature in the farming sequences but even that is more about like the successes of man than it is about how how we need to take care of the earth which is a core Ghibli theme if you haven't noticed yet. Um, if the storytelling was stronger and the ending had landed, I think maybe it, it could be a decent like kind of like Black Cauldron where it's like, I see why some people might be into this. But as a Ghibli feature, I don't think it, it functions. And the directing is the ultimate downfall of it, which which sucks for Goro because that's a rough foot to get off. Um, uh, okay, next one. From Up on Poppy Hill is a different beast entirely. I actually think this movie is competently directed. It is 2D animated and it's unlike Hayo's style, it's sort of its its own thing. It's even, I would say, charming at times. It's fun at certain moments. I, I think there, there are parts of it that are actively funny. But there's, um, From Up on Poppy Hill is about this, this young girl and there's uh, a young boy who also goes to school and he's a part of all these cool clubs and writes for an upstart paper for the school that, that like he prints himself. The school doesn't print it. The school is thinking about, uh, is looking at shutting down the building in which all the, like, the, the, the philosophy club, the physics club, the, the the rocket club, the astronomy club, all these like STEM clubs, STEM and arts and, and stuff like that. It's a bit preposterous. One, that all these things are in this, in this one building. And two, that the school would be like, hmm, nice extracurricular activities you got going on. Let's just tear that down because this place is a little bit dirty instead of like sending a janitor in there since it is school property. So I don't know why it wouldn't be cleaned routinely just like the rest of the school. But that's just one in a long list of, of plot holes for this movie. More prominent ones are um, that that the the aforementioned boy and girl uh, sort of fall for each other and they're they're getting the sort of meet cute like ooh we could like edit the paper together oh my god isn't that so cute wait we're brother and sister so she invites him over uh, for for a family dinner she shows him a picture of her dad with uh, some crewmates and he's like oh shit I have that same fucking picture and that's my dad this man is dead so he can't he can't tell a story they are very much still in love with each other and go well uh i guess we can't poke but they still work together to 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 get the clubhouse renovated and cleaned so that the school will 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 overturn their decision that doesn't really matter even though i actually do like that aspect of the story it's all undercut by this love story between a brother and sister and I don't really know what to do because we're... Umi. Look, I know we can't do anything about it, but just know, I love you.
but all of their friends think that they're just in love and 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 talk about how cute they are and like poke fun at them for for being like secretive and like stowing away and being all like hush hush about the relationship and they don't tell anybody about the sibling thing but that's very convenient that they don't have to re-explain when they find out they're not actually related and they do get to poke but for me it's a bit weird that they didn't immediately write each other off as potential romantic and sexual partners it's just a bit gross for me the way that this happens her dad uh after world war ii wound up uh getting a baby essentially handed to him by a crewmate and he was like Oh my god, I need to care of this baby. But I already have like several children. I don't have space for this. Went to a friend of his and was like, yo, here's a baby. And apparently that's it. Because this man who received a baby and raised it throughout his life, apparently at no point asked, is this your baby? Whose baby is this? Is someone going to come looking for this baby? I don't see why that wouldn't have transpired. It doesn't make any sense to me that no one along the way would have gone, hey, really super, super double mega quick. Whose baby is this? The conflict of the entire movie dissolves with one person asking a basic question. This is something that made the movie actively more uncomfortable and actively less enjoyable that could have just you know, not been there. So this is the closest that Goro gets to making a good movie. The forest gives me nothing but joy. <laughs> Ronya Robber's Daughter is a series uh, about a kid uh, named Ronya, who is the daughter of uh, Robert. Th this feels self-explanatory now. I'm saying it out loud, but I, I, uh, it's um, it's not good. Bad actually is how I would how I would describe it. The core concept is kind of interesting. The idea that it's this group of bandits. Uh, one of them has a kid with his wife growing up amongst bandits. That's kind of neat. That's what I'm talking about with like the moral complication thing. Like how does a child grow up in this environment and grow up to be wholesome and, and, and kind and not a scumbag. But then it's not like that at all because all these bandits are just kind of dumb. It's like a YouTube kids show. It's not for kids, it's for people who aren't paying attention. The storytelling is so irrelevant to the show. It's all about like physical bits and gags that are only made more awkward by the clunky and hideous 3D animation style. The physics, the physics is, uh, did you see that? Can you see this? She's jumping like 30 feet in the air. There's no consistency whatsoever. I don't know how heavy anything is. I don't know where we are, when we are, how big a horse is, teeth, and again with the dad issues. And the woman is a subservient female figure who just cooks and cleans and is the voice of wisdom and in times when the men just can't get their shit together. Oh, fuck. Alright, I'll talk about your wig. Fine, fine, I'll talk about Earwig. This movie is one of the worst things I've ever seen in my life. It hurts my eyes, it hurts my brain. <laughs> what happened between Ronya and Earwig is Goro figured out how to use Lightroom, and that's about it. Okay, uh, I got a little angry uh, last time I was talking about your wigs. So we're gonna try that again. What I talked about most was the visual aesthetic, and while I think 
uh, visuals are important, especially for an animated movie, it isn't make or break, really. You can have a successful movie, even a successful animated movie, if the story is strong enough, but Earwig's story is exactly what sinks it. The first 95% of the movie is pretty much filler material leading up to the last five minutes, which is super rushed and and inconclusive and unsatisfying. Earwig and the Witch is a bit like Caillou in the sense that I think it teaches kids bad life lessons and teaches them to be meaner to their parents. Because Earwig's sort of demeanor is a little bit more cheery, but her intent and what she expects and how bratty she is is just as bad or worse at the end of the movie than it was at, at the beginning when she first arrives at the, at the house. She's constantly breaking rules and then she doesn't really face consequences. The, the consequences she does face, she winds up twisting those in such a way that she gets something out of it. it it's all manipulation and, and amoralism. And I just, I don't like it, especially not for a Ghibli movie, it's supposed to be for kids. And I have to assume that this movie's for kids because it's really, really bad otherwise. But if they're trying to tap into the universal Ghibli style, then this is a colossal failure. As I mentioned with Earthsea, there's no sense of awe or wonder or appreciation of nature or or greater ethical lesson or anything like that. It's just sloppy 3D animation mixed with some hollow storytelling mixed with fairly uninteresting characters and quirky design, I guess. To attribute it all to the visual style I think is completely unfair because it fails in so many more ways and much more spectacularly in those ways. That's just kind of what I wanted to talk about with Earwig. I'm not going to harp on it forever because there's plenty of articles and plenty of videos talking about about uh, this godforsaken movie. So let's pivot to Goro in totality. Goro's films are... films. I think they get worse the more he makes which is usually the inverse of what happens. I'm not going to say Goro can't make movies anymore, that doesn't feel fair at all, but I will say that perhaps Studio Ghibli should die with Hayao. Perhaps the Studio Ghibli legacy is more important than someone named Miyazaki making movies there until the well is run dry. Now, Goro wants to keep making movies under his own production studio or something like that. I think that's totally fair. If he is that passionate and that insistent upon continuing to make 3D animated movies, you know, more power to him. But as it stands, he has made some of the worst Ghibli movies on the market. I hope he makes movies that he loves and that he's proud of and that Hayao would be proud of. Because right now, it doesn't feel like he loves making movies. It feels like he loves the idea of making movies. Good luck to you, Goro. I wish you all the best.